is the body of the earth, the part that keeps it all together is rock. You can have life and creation, but it will all crumble without a solid base. Same with society, companies, relationships, identities, knowledge, almost anything, both tangible and intangible, like those forests and trees sitting as a skin over the rocks of the earth. Without that strength inside, without that stone, it would crumble. A very warm greetings to all the participants here for this webinar. I welcome you all to this session. Every rock has a story. A webinar on joy of discovering about the mysteries of our earth by Professor Ethan Baxter, a geochemist with research interest in isotope geochemistry and geochronology, tectonics, metamorphism, and earth history from Boston College Department of Earth and Environment Sciences, Massachusetts, USA. My heartfelt gratitude to Professor Ethan Baxter for accepting our request to conduct a session for our young students, colleagues, team DPS Nashik, Lava Nagpur, and Varanasi, India. Before I invite Professor Baxter to continue, I would like to read out some ground rules for today's session. I would like you all to just have a look, switch on your camera if possible, mute your microphone, raise your hand if you have any query. You will be given time at the end to ask questions. Keep your questions here on the Padlet link. I'm going to share a Padlet link wherein you can post your questions so that, you know, sometimes it happens that you have some questions popping up and a session is going on. So we will not be in, you know, uh, waiting for your, you know, queries. You'll, immediately you can write down your query, your question on the Padlet link, and then I'll share it with Mr. Baxter. And if possible, he'll answer it in, during the session or we'll request him to answer those questions after the session. And I'll be sharing this with everybody. I hope it is fine, everyone. May I get a thumbs up? Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, dear all. I will now stop presenting my screen and I'll be sharing the I'll be sharing the link in the chat box and I would request Professor Ethan Baxter to continue. Thank you, sir. Wonderful. Well, I wanna say, first of all, uh, thank you for such a wonderful introduction. I love the way you brought so many things together in your words. Um, and of course, it's wonderful that this is an opportunity to bring all of us together. Um, across, across the globe here today, I'm, I'm, I feel so fortunate to be able to share uh, my story and my stories of rocks with, with all of you this evening for you and this morning for me. So what I'm going to do is try to share uh, my screen. So let me go with that. And then uh, once I do that, uh, one moment, please. I'm now going to launch this to presenter mode. And are we seeing the proper presentation or, or should I switch uh, the screen so you're seeing just the, the single slide? I to think it's fine. Yes. Yes, but we would love it if your entire yeah. one screen slide is, is on one on this full screen. If you can do it. Hang on, tell me if this is better. Sorry. It's okay, no issues. Let's get on. Yeah, um, uh, Professor Baxter, we can go to view mode, view mode, and we can have it. Yeah, is this better? Uh, I think view, view. We'll go to view instead of animations. We'll go to view on the uh, the icons. Then to the go to the slideshow. Yeah. So, yeah, so what are you seeing? What are you seeing now? We're seeing the slide and other slides on the uh, stamp of the screen. If you can go to slideshow, 
That is just, just go to your, yes, go to your right. There is a slideshow written. Yeah, absolutely great. Is that good? Wonderful, absolutely. Perfect, all right. Then with that, um, I will I will begin. Uh, and and uh, as we said at the beginning, if you have questions, uh, yeah, keep them in mind. I'll try to look for questions as we go, but I'll definitely leave time at the end of the presentation uh, for questions from, from everybody in the audience. So um, I'm gonna be talking about stories um, and I'll be talking about stories that begin with rocks. And as was already described in the introduction, a lot of the theme of the presentation today will be about using rocks to tell stories in particular about water. Um, and one of the themes that I wanna be weaving into this entire presentation is something that was already mentioned in the introduction, how so many things are connected together in the earth. Before I go too much further, um, I wanna say this, uh, at least for me, when I was growing up, I've always enjoyed rocks and minerals. I'm not sure about you, you guys, but I was one of those kids. When I was growing up, I had a collection that I started when I was five years old. Uh, I actually still have some of my rock collection from when I was a kid at my office. Um, at, at, in my professor office. Um, and I started by just identifying and looking at the colors and the shapes because I loved that so much. But perhaps the most important thing that I want to convey as we start is that rocks and minerals, as beautiful and interesting and exciting as they are, are so much more than just identifying them. Identifying what you're looking at is important, but that's just a first step towards this incredible world, literally an entire planet of stories and information about how the world around us works and how we interact with that planet. Um, it's those stories that really make the rocks and minerals exciting. And that's why um, one of the things I wanna tell you about is this, I created um, a YouTube series. I'm not sure if you guys get YouTube or if you like YouTube, um, but I created a YouTube series um, for young learners called Every Rock Has a Story. Uh, hang on just one second here. Um, and um, Every Rock Has a Story is, it's a growing collection of videos. Um, there are now 71 videos posted on the YouTube channel. And each one of these begins with a different rock. So if you like rocks, you're gonna like this video series, but then each one starts with the rock and then goes into these stories, stories that span every different part of the earth and the environment. On the slide here, I give you just a few examples of the kind of topics that we get into. And so what I'll be doing in today's presentation is mentioning a few of these episodes of Every Rock Has a Story, you can go take a look at them uh, later on, or if you kind of like the way that I'm talking about the earth, there are 71 episodes that you can check out anytime. Uh, so look for those as we go through the um, uh, the presentation today. It's been a lot of fun to make that, that series of videos, um, just like it's a lot of fun being with you live and in person, which is the best way to do it. Or I guess I'm not live, what are we, what is this a Zoom thing, we're on, we're on Zoom. Uh, to tell you about the earth. Yes, what's going on? There we go. Um, so, water. I mentioned that the theme of today's presentation will be about water. Um, and how that relates to, to rocks. Now, everybody knows what water is, okay? I don't have to ask anybody, you know, do you know what water is? The great thing about water is that no matter who you are, where you're from, what you're doing, everybody understands that water is an important part of our planet. What's interesting about water is that if I asked you all this right now, I said, write down something that's important about water. Everybody could answer that. No one would have trouble, right? But what would be interesting would be to look at everybody's answers and see how many different ideas came out. Water is important to people and it's important to the earth in so many ways. 
And part of my purpose is to show you the, some of the variety. We certainly won't cover all those things, but the variety of ways that water is important. Today, we'll have time to talk about how water acts as a shaper of our planet. Um, uh, water um, actually is present inside rocks, which is a surprise for many people, but it's critically important to how the earth works. We'll talk about how water can then be a trigger for some of the most significant natural disasters that we can face in our planet and must therefore prepare for. We'll talk about how water can get into the very deepest parts of the earth. Also, often a great surprise, and it was a surprise to scientists um, in some discoveries that were made just in the last few years that I'll tell you about. And if we have time, I hope at the very end, I'll talk about some of the ways in which water is an important responder and is playing an important role in our changing climate that the planet is facing today. So that's kind of a, a roadmap of where we're going. Uh, and as I said, that's just the beginning of the stories that we can tell about rocks and the stories about water. So the last thing before I dive into my first story um, is just to reemphasize something that, that came up right in the introduction before I, I began. And I, um, I think it's one of the most important things about being a scientist in today's earth. It's different from what it was being a scientist 20 or 50 years ago, and especially in the geosciences, the science of the earth. It's critically important to understand how things connect together. So if we just think about rocks and just learn about rocks in, in just in one small part and only think about rocks themselves and don't seek to appreciate all of the connections from rocks to other things, we're really missing out on so much. And that goes for anything. If you study biology, plants, human life, society, uh, politics, uh, anything, geography, you want to be thinking not just about that topic that you're interested in, but how does it connect to other things? So in all of my teaching and all of my communications at Boston College, I emphasize this issue of connection. So let's explore some of these connections that we can make with rocks. Um, I want to start by talking about water as a shaper of what I call watery worlds. Uh, some of you may recognize this picture. This is the Grand Canyon uh, in the United States. It's an incredible place. It's one of the most amazing places that I've ever been to. I got to go there just a few months ago um, when I was creating this episode, um, which is uh, episode 68 of Every Rock Has a Story, which is all about the Grand Canyon. So if you want to learn more about the story of this place, uh, please check out on episode 68, Grand Canyon. Um, but I want to talk about a different land feature. Of course, the Grand Canyon, as you may know, was carved by the Colorado River, the mighty Colorado River, which dug down through that gorge um, and created uh, the Grand Canyon over many millions of years. I want to explore some other uh, land features. Um, I'm wondering if I, are you troubled by the, the panel of faces on the side of the screen? Or are you seeing just the presentation? Just the presentation? No, we are seeing the presentation as well as the panelists. Uh, oh, okay. you, yeah, but it's fine. Yeah, I think I like to see, um, I know I like to see the people too, so I'll, I'll leave that there. Um, so my question is this, I'm showing here um, another landform, okay? So before we saw a deep Grand Canyon, this is a different landform. Um, and I'm wondering if we were together, I would say, does anybody know what, what this landform is? Um, since we're remotely, I'm gonna talk through it my, myself. Um, this part in blue, that's actually a long river. But here, as it's entering this sea, which is what all this other blue is around, it starts to branch out, branch out, branch out. We call this uh, feature a delta, a delta. Some of you may recognize that. A delta is what we call it when a river enters a larger body of water, the ocean, the sea, and that shape that we're seeing, that's almost like a tree fanning out. Um, that uh, is what, that's what the manifestation of all the sediment carried by that river being dumped out into the, uh, the ocean. Um, this particular delta um, is important in my country. This is the Mississippi River Delta. So this comes out um, right out, out of Louisiana. They call this a bird's foot delta. Some people say it looks like a, a bird's foot at the bottom. 
But a geologist, and of course, this is a, you know, uh, an overhead satellite image, a geologist can look at a landform like this and recognize that shape and say, ah, that is a river delta. That's where water flowed into the sea. Um, so geologists can look things at a very large scale and, and learn those stories. Um, here's another episode of Every Rock Has a Story um, called Rivers to Oceans. Um, and this also talks about features that geologists can look for, not on a huge scale like the delta, but on a smaller scale. I'm not sure if you can see in that rock right there. That rock has preserved beautiful ripples. Those are wave ripples um, from what would have been uh, a shallow uh, a beach. So those are other features we can look for in the rocks to tell us about ancient beaches, ancient water. Now, here, I want to take us to um, another place. Now, this is a black and white photograph, but I wonder if you can recognize what we're looking at here. Ancient river spilling out, sediment, high sides. This is another delta. Can you see that? Geologists learn from the other delta that we recognized how to, how to recognize a delta. So this, again, is evidence of water flowing through this river, spilling out into this ancient sea. Of course, the big difference here is that there's no water anymore, right? Can you see that? This, this place is completely dry. There's no water here. The river is dried up. Even this ancient sea into, into which it spilled is dried up. Um, it turns out that this is a delta on Mars, okay, on the planet Mars. And when scientists discovered this landform, evidence for actual water on the planet Mars, for flowing rivers and ancient seas, this was an incredible discovery of the fact that not only Earth was once a watery planet, but Mars was literally a watery planet with rivers and seas. One of the reasons why that's exciting is because water brings up the possibility for life. It's possible, not proven. We have to be very important about that. It hasn't been proven, but it is possible that in the Martian past, there was life on the planet because of the presence of water. Um, this is another image, um, and this this here shows um, this ancient sea. This is now a, a false color, but that's a crater, and that crater was filled with water. There's the river. Look at that river on the upper uh, on the upper left there. Look at that snaking through, filling in, spilling into that crater, and then see that delta shape there. That's the delta. This black circle shows the area where NASA scientists wanted to direct a new rover. And this is an artist's rendition of what it probably looks like at some time in the Martian past. Can you believe that? We think of Mars as a desolate, dry, barren place where no life could exist. But that landform, the rocks of that delta on Mars, give strong evidence that this is what Mars once looked like. Might there have been life at that time? Um, evidence for water on Mars also extends to what these rovers have done. Um, I hope you've heard about the rover missions that have been sent to Mars. These are literally robot geologists um, in every way, shape, and form. They're the only geologists that have ever been on Mars. This one is named Curiosity. Um, this is one of the places that Curiosity has been. And look at the rocks. Look at those layers. Can you guys see those layers right in the middle of the screen? Boy, oh boy, when a geologist sees layered rocks like that, we call those sedimentary rocks. And layered sedimentary rocks like that are often laid down by water, flowing water, rivers or streams or ponds or lakes. One of the things that the Curiosity rover did was it looked at the composition of these rocks. It has a number of different instruments. And you can see right here, it actually drilled down into the rock and collected that powder. And it used an instrument called an X-ray diffractometer, X-ray diffraction. 
And with that method, it was able to identify an extremely important mineral. And that mineral is clay. You've probably all heard of clay before. Clay on our planet, of course, is very common. It's not terribly exciting or beautiful. But to make clay, you need water. You need water to make clay. So something that's so common on our planet, on Mars, the mere discovery of this single mineral clay in great abundance is extremely vivid evidence of a wet Martian past in these rocks. So these aren't just any sedimentary rocks. These are rocks that were created in the presence of liquid water. Now, enter the new Mars rover. The newest Mars rover is this one right here. This is called Perseverance. And the Perseverance rover um, was launched uh, to this very location, okay? Um, and it landed right down the bottom. Just, just off the screen here was where it landed last year. It's been there for over a year now. Um, and the, the actual landing um, of the Mars rover, let's move this out. The actual landing of the Mars rover was last February, uh, February 2021. Uh, wow, it's, it's been actually almost two years now. I can't believe it, how time has flied. Um, I'm not going to play the video right now, but I'll tell you, if you guys can jump on YouTube or the NASA website later on, there is a live video of this rover landing on the surface of Mars. Some of you may have seen it. It is absolutely breathtaking. Um, so if you've seen it, you should watch it again, because I'm probably going to watch it again. If you haven't, check it out. But it actually worked. They landed that rover. And what has the rover been doing over the last year? It's been out there um, collecting rocks. So I wasn't joking when I said um, it's, a, um, it's a geologist. This is a picture here of a little hole. See that little hole right there? One of the most important parts of the Perseverance rover's mission is to collect rocks. Um, and what it's doing is it's drilling little holes um, down into the rock. And this is an actual picture from the surface of Mars. See in the middle of this little thing, that little core of rock right there, that red rock? That's about the size of a piece of chalk or a finger. And that's what the Mars rover is doing. It's drilling out little bits of rock, yeah, about the size of a finger. And it's bundling those up. And the idea is that maybe 10 years from now, another mission is going to blast off to Mars, go down to Mars, gather those samples, and then blast them back to Earth. So probably in, I don't know, 10, 20 years, we will have actual samples collected on Mars in our laboratories here on Earth. And for all the, you know, the eighth and ninth graders there, just think about that. Where are you going to be in 15 years? Okay. You might be in a laboratory. I bet some of you will be in a laboratory and you might be studying the first ever Mars rocks returned to planet Earth. This is exciting stuff, you guys. Um, and one of my uh, YouTube episodes of Every Rock Has a Story is also about Mars exploration. Oops. Uh, this episode um, is features um, one of my friends. Uh, her name is Tanya Bosak, and she is on the Mars rover team. So she is one of the people that's deciding which rocks to collect, where to get them from. And in 10 or 15 years, she's going to be getting some of these rocks, looking for evidence for life on, on, uh, on Mars in the past. So that's the first of our examples. That's the first of our stories. I'll go a little bit faster through some of these other ones because I want to leave plenty of time for questions. I want to talk about water in rocks right now. Um, a lot of people don't know about the fact that there's water literally contained inside rocks and minerals. We already talked about clay. There's another mineral I want to talk about that has water. To tell that story, we have to start with the Earth's mantle. Now, I hope you guys have heard of the mantle. The mantle of the Earth is the really big layer below the crust. The crust is what we live on. It's not that thick. Below the crust is this incredibly vast mantle. And the rock that the mantle is mostly made of is this stuff. It's called peridotite. It's green. It's a beautiful green rock. And we have chunks of peridotite from the mantle that get blasted up to the surface in volcanoes. So we know very well what that mantle looks like. Well, it turns out 
that if you add water to mantle rock, and that can happen near the surface um, where the crust gets thin, water can circulate down from the oceans, for example, and get into the mantle, you create a different rock called serpentine. That's a picture of serpentine. And serpentine is also very pretty. It's a pretty sort of a olivey green rock that you can see here, but it is loaded with water. How much water does serpentine have in it? Well, you can think of it this way. It has about 15% of its mass as water. So 15% of the mass is water. Or we can think of it this way. Since rock is about three times as dense as water, that means that in terms of volume, that rock is almost half its volume in water. And this is absolutely remarkable. This rock right now, you can see a picture of it right there, actually contains that much water. It's stunning to visualize. Most people wouldn't appreciate that. And what's important now is what does that water do when it gets into that rock? Well, let me tell you that story. Once we get that water into the rocks, that water now becomes part of the Earth's system. We are studying water in rocks by going to places like the Alps, the Alps in Europe, the Alps in Italy. And this is from an expedition we did with my group to the Italian Alps in 2017. That tall mountain right there, that's called Monte Viso. It's right on the French-Italian border. It's one of the highest peaks in the Alps. And it's almost entirely made out of that rock serpentine. It's an incredibly watery mountain, although it's, it doesn't look like it, right? It's, it's all rock. That rock used to be deep below the oceans. And it was pushed up to the surface by tectonic processes. We've collected a lot of those rocks. Here's one of my students. This is one of my graduate students, Anna. Um, and she's gone up this way. We didn't climb all the way to the top. I don't do that. But down here near the foothills, Anna collected this and some other rocks that tell us about that watery story of water getting, in, water getting into rocks and then what happens when that water gets out. Um, I have a wonderful episode, it's episode number 10, one of the earliest episodes of Every Rock Has a Story, all about serpentine and how that water gets into it, and actually some of the work that we're doing in the Italian Alps. So where I wanna go next is to this next story. Now that we know that water can get into rocks, I wanna explain some of the ways that water in rocks can actually trigger some of the most important natural disasters that we have to deal with on our planet. Um, and I'm showing here a map of the planet and all of the black dots that you might see, um, those are earthquakes. So this is a map of where earthquakes happen on the planet. And we can look um, in India, for example, a lot of earthquakes up in the Northern parts of India. We can look at the United States where I am. There's a little bit of earthquakes over on the East Coast where I am, but you go out to the West Coast, tons of earthquakes. One of the things to notice about a map like this is that there seems to be some pretty clear patterns, right? In where those earthquakes are happening. And I don't have time to go into all the details, but I do wanna focus on one aspect of that pattern, and that's something called the ring of fire. We call the geologists call it the ring of fire. And you'll notice it's all around the Pacific Rim. So you go down um, up through some of the Pacific Islands, um, through Indonesia, the Philippines, Japan, up through Alaska, down the United States into South America. The ring of fire is a place where we have lots of earthquakes. Look at them all over here on this map lots of earthquakes and lots of lots of volcanoes. And I'm gonna tell you right now, the reason for that is water. That's because at those continental margins, that's where something called subduction happens. Now there's a lot going on in this picture, but let's realize this is looking at Japan. So imagine Japan on the map, right on that ring of fire. And here the Pacific Ocean, which has been loaded up with water, 
that's one of the places where water can get into those rocks and create serpentine. A subduction zone is where the Pacific plate goes down. It goes under the ocean. Serpentine and other watery rocks are brought down beneath the continents, beneath Japan, like that. And what happens is that as, as those watery rocks go down, as they start to get heated up, the water gets released. And when that water gets released, that can trigger earthquakes. It's not the only thing that triggers earthquakes, but the release of water from earthquakes can sort of allow those plates to suddenly slip. All of the red and green blobs are where earthquakes are occurring in three dimensions, deep into the earth. And you can see a lot of them are happening within that subduction zone. Water is a trigger for earthquakes and volcanoes. As we take water even deeper, 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 at some point, even more of that water comes off. And actually, this is where most of the serpentine lets out its water. That water goes deep enough that it actually allows the mantle to melt. So more shallow regions, when the water comes out, you get an earthquake. Deeper regions, when the water comes out, you get the formation of molten magma. And that magma bubbles up and gives us explosive volcanoes. This is a picture of a, of a volcano from Alaska, but the most ferocious and explosive volcanoes happen in subduction zones like Japan or Alaska or South America um, or Indonesia. Um, and these are the most explosive volcanoes that we have. They're the most dangerous volcanoes that we have. Um, I've got a couple episodes that talk about this. This one is called Volcano Fuel. And Volcano Fuel talks explicitly about how water is supercharging those, those volcanoes and making them so, so explosive. That's episode 29. And this one, episode 70, was filmed at Yellowstone National Park in our country, in the United States. Yellowstone National Park is recognized as a sleeping giant. We call it a, a super volcano. Um, and when it last erupted about 600,000 years ago, it spewed ash that covered half of North America. Big volcano. And it's sleeping and restless right now. And so you can hear about the story of water um, as that sleeping volcano rests. And again, there's our ring of fire. All those places. Maybe you visited some of these places. We're not, we don't really have a subduction zone in India. The reason for the big earthquakes in India is because of an ancient subduction zone where two continents collided, the Indian continent and Asia to the north. That formed the Himalayas. And still, as parts of India are still trying to go deeper, deeper, we get those cracks and earthquakes in the northern part of the country in particular. But here, this ring of fire is such an important part of the, the characteristic of the earth and the role of water. A few more stories, and then I'll get some questions from you guys. Um, we talked about the mantle, and in the background there, I've got another picture, kind of a close-up of that beautiful green rock. Isn't it beautiful? Peridotite. Peridotite, what the mantle's made of. Sometimes I joke with my friends, if you ever look at like an introductory figure, you might have seen something like this in school. They show the layers of the earth. Everybody always colors in the mantle red. Have you noticed that? The mantle's always, they always color it red. Well, the mantle isn't red, it's green. It's a beautiful green color. So I'm on a, I'm on a crusade. We should all be coloring the mantle green um, when, we, when we look at it. Um, the mantle uh, is uh, the biggest part of the earth in terms of volume, if you think about it. Most of the earth is the mantle. So this green rock, peridotite, is incredibly important. Um, and peridotite doesn't have any water in it unless it gets added in somehow. And subduction zones, as we're seeing again here, are a way that water could go down into the mantle. Now we typically think that most or all of that water does get released here in the subduction zone, makes those earthquakes and make those magmas. But some people are interested in that red arrow. Does some water go even deeper down? Do we have, is there any water stored in this huge mantle? And how much water would that be? And we can learn about this by something I mentioned before. These are chunks of the mantle, and I've got a whole bunch of these here from my collection. This is, this is from a place in Arizona called San Carlos, Arizona. 
And here's another one here too. This is episode eight. Um, this episode is called Green. That's all about how the mantle is green and not red. Um, and I'm holding one of those samples right there. Um, and I'll tell you about episode 69 in just a second. But these things are called xenoliths. Xenolith means foreign rock. And these are xenoliths from the mantle. So the reason we call them foreign rocks is that these the, the mantle doesn't belong on the surface. It's foreign to the Earth's surface. But they're brought to the Earth's surface in eruptions. So the gray rock here, see that gray rock on the outside? That's a magma. That's a volcanic rock. And it erupted from very, very deep origins and so rapidly that it ripped off chunks of the green mantle and spewed them out on the surface. So even though we've never been to the mantle, we've never like drilled that far, we do have actual rock from the mantle that the earth has brought up for us. This episode number 69 is one of the newest episodes. This talks about a scientist who was looking at what the mantle is made of. In this episode, it's about how the mantle is being squished into forming. But we wanna talk about water. It turns out when water gets in the mantle, it can be more easily squished and deformed. So the question is, how much water is down there? Oh, I couldn't forget to show you this slide. Some people ask, um, where, you know, what does it look like or where did these xenoliths come from? And one example is this right here. This is a very, very special picture from a very special place. This is actually a type of volcanic eruption called a kimberlite. You can see that word up there, kimberlite. Um, kimberlites are extremely violent eruptions that can bring up chunks of the mantle from great, great depth. Um, this one is a special one because it's in the town of Kimberley, South Africa. Kimberley is why we call Kimberlites. Kimberlites is named after the town of Kimberley. Now, you might notice this one is uh, filled with water right now. This is like a big, deep hole, and this has been mined out. Do you have any guess what they mined out of this Kimberlite in South Africa? They mined diamonds. Diamonds like these have come out of Kimberlites around the world. South Africa, there are Kimberlites in India, there are Kimberlites uh, in Canada and Russia and Brazil. Diamonds um, grow deep, deep, deep in the mantle, and they only get brought out, generally speaking, by these explosive eruptions and these beautiful diamonds. Now, everybody's heard of diamonds, right? Everybody wants to have a diamond ring or a diamond fancy stuff like that. Um, but to a scientist, to a scientist, the most interesting diamonds aren't the ones that are perfectly clear. The most interesting diamonds are the ones that have some stuff in them, some mess, some color, some other minerals included inside the diamond. You might even see this guy here, a little bitty black thing in there. This is one of my diamonds that I have in my collection. Those inclusions inside diamonds are messengers from the deep for scientists. Here's one of my scientist friends. His name is Graham Pearson. He's a scientist in Canada, and he's been studying diamonds for a long time. And he's holding a tiny one right there. Yeah, that doesn't look very pretty. Probably not going to make a fancy ring out of that one, right? But inside that diamond, he was able to use a laser beam and an x-ray beam to identify a very special mineral called ringwoodite. Ringwoodite is not a mineral that you should ever have heard of or ever have seen because it's never been found on the surface of the earth until he found it inside a diamond from the deep earth. And he also found that this ringwoodite was another water mineral. It's got water in it, lots of water. So for the first time, Graham Pearson, water in a tiny mineral inside a diamond from a kimberlite. Do you see what we have to recognize? We have to start from really big and exciting things and keep on looking, sometimes smaller, 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 smaller. He's found an incredible resource of diamond, uh, excuse me, of, of water in the earth. And this paper, these people actually found 
ice, ice in diamonds from the deep earth. Now you should be thinking, wait a second, ice? When I think of ice, when I think of ice, I think of cold, right? I think of someplace really cold. And you should know when you go deep in the earth, it's not cold, it's very hot. How could there possibly be ice in the deep earth? The reason it's not exactly ice like we have it on the surface, it's a different form of solid water. And it's stable, not just because the temperature, but because of the pressure. There's such great pressure deep in the earth that this is an unusual form of solid water called ice seven. It's not regular ice. It's actually existing in the earth. And that brings us to our very last story. Uh, yes, and I did want to mention this one. Um, everybody likes diamonds, right? Who doesn't want to hear a story about diamonds? Um, and this is one episode that talks about uh, diamonds in the earth and about Graham Pearson's work, Finding Water in the Deep Earth, episode 18. The last story I want to tell is about climate change. Um, and this is a very important and a very long story that I'm not going to have time to fully cover today. But I wanted to mention just one way that water serves as a responder to climate change. And we've kind of already given a hint to it. Um, it's the it, it begins by recognizing that water, when you freeze it, makes a mineral. It makes a rock. And that rock is called ice. Ice is an actual rock. It's a mineral. A lot of people don't think of it that way, but it is. If you look up in a, in a good mineralogy textbook, ice, it's a mineral, solid water. H2O is the formula. Um, and of course, on our surface, we know that um, when it gets cold, the ice freezes. And when it gets warm, the ice starts to melt. This is one of my other scientist friends. His name is Jeremy Shacken. He's a professor with me at Boston College. And you can see he's standing uh, in a little pond and he's standing in Greenland. This is, this is the, the very highest parts of Greenland where it's supposed to be cold and supposed to be storing all this ice. But as the planet is warming, Greenland is melting. The solid ice on the Greenland ice sheet is slowly melting. Every summer, it melts more and that water goes where? When Greenland melts, where does the water flow? It flows into the ocean. Um, so that Greenland ice, that's what that's the part of Greenland. It's all covered by ice. And <laughs> this is a picture I like. This is another uh, two other of my scientist friends, Mark Bain, who's also um, at BC, another a friend of ours, Sarah Das, um, who works locally as well. Here they are doing research on Greenland. And Mark is actually jumping over. I'm not sure if this was a good idea, everybody, but he's jumping over this river of ice in the summer. Um, I hope you can see this video, but this is video. I love this. Mark Bain took this video and this shows a barren landscape, a barren landscape of only one rock, a white rock called ice. And through that barren landscape, we see a river cutting through and that river is molten ice. A lot of times you think when you think of molten, you think about magma, but here the molten rock in this case is just good old familiar water. And these streams are forming every summer and they flow into the ocean and they make the sea level rise. Um, episode 32 talks about glaciers, talks about ice and the melting of the ice um, across the world and the importance of sea level rise. Um, and again, because we're short on time, I'll just say this. The, one of the challenging things for everybody, for everybody on earth, is to understand the global connections of climate change. And it's because most of us just live where we live. We're not flying to Greenland every year. I've never been to Greenland myself. But it's critical to realize that when climate warms and when ice is melting in Greenland, that causes sea levels to rise across the planet. Sea level rising in India, along Indian coastlines. Sea level rising in Massachusetts, where I live, in our coastline. This is a picture from just a couple of years ago. I'm not sure if any of you have ever been to Boston, Massachusetts. That's my hometown. We're right on the, in the Atlantic Ocean, right on the coast. 
But this is what it looked like in 2018. We had a big winter storm. And you can see that the, the streets here are completely flooded. That's about two feet of water. And this isn't just a puddle. That's actually the ocean. And this is what's happening now. When storms come, the oceans are higher. And the ocean is getting blown into uh, the streets of cities like Boston and, and New York and also places like Mumbai in, in, in India. So sea level rise is an issue for everybody on planet Earth. Um, and we have to pay attention to that. I want to leave time for questions. So I'm going to wrap up uh, right now. I think we've got a few minutes left. Um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, these connections uh, that I've shown. Remember, we started with rocks. But we've learned about Mars, water in rocks, volcanoes and earthquakes, water in diamonds from the deep earth, and even had a beginning of a conversation with climate change. Um, and as I've said, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about the idea of learning about the earth through stories. Um, and so these, uh, you know, the Every Rock Has a Story episodes that I've made are, they're really a lot of fun. Um, if you haven't checked them out, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, you can find them on YouTube. It's called Every Rock Has a Story. Search Every Rock Has a Story on YouTube. My channel will come up. 71 episodes so far. Two more are being made uh, in the next month. Um, and I guarantee you can, everybody can find a topic that is exciting to them. So I will leave it there and I will unshare my screen if I can. Uh, how do I do that? And show... And then we can take some questions. Am I still sharing or have I unshared yet? You're still sharing. Yes, now it's done. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ethan. I'll just share, there are a few questions on the panel. I hope my screen is visible now. I've got these uh, three questions. Uh, okay, I'll just, I hope my screen is visible, Ms. Shehnaz, if you could just let me know, yeah. So first question is Nishat Pawar from DK Slavan Nagpur. He is uh, willing to ask, can we depict the story of any random rock? Okay, <laughs> Nishat wanted to ask this question. So yeah, I would request, sir. I think he's there, no? I'm here, I'm here, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yes. I got muted for a second. This is a wonderful question. Uh, and so thank you for, for asking this one. I get this question a lot. Um, a lot of people will say, yeah, but, you know, you were talking about diamonds and green things and really cool stuff. The rocks that I have don't look as interesting as that. Do my rocks have stories? Yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. Remember, every rock, every rock has a story. Um, and in fact, um, again, just because we won't have a lot of time today, if you go through those episodes that I've created, a lot of the episodes start with a rock. It, uh, kind of looks a little boring, right? It's, well, it's like, it's black, it's brown. There's not much to say about it. Sometimes the simplest looking rocks have the most exciting stories. So one of the thing I'll say for, for that student who asked that, uh, Nishad, um, episodes 45, 46, and 47 are all about how to collect your own rock and how to make your own story. So I would suggest for you, watch episode 45, 46, 47, and you can take any random rock, literally something you found in, you know, outside at home, in the street, in the playground, in the mountains, any place, and you can learn how do you tell the story of your rock. And it starts with your imagination, your creativity. That's an awesome question. Yes, Nishad, and you're going to share that story with all of us. And I'll be sharing that with Mr. Ethan. <laughs> Now, Wonderful. next we have, I think, uh, Vatsal is asking, does mantle contains water when it's underneath the earth? Yeah, that was, I think, yeah. Yeah, so we, we talked about that a little bit. Um, and I know I went over it quickly, but we didn't used to think that the mantle had any water in it. 
we used to we used to think that the mantle was pretty much dry. And that's what's changed. Those two papers that I showed you, I guess it's been in the last 10 years that those have come out. But we've now, uh, we, the scientific community, not myself, but as Graham Pearson and other researchers have found tiny minerals inside of diamonds that are providing direct evidence that there's actually quite a bit of water in the deep earth, in the mantle. And that is critically important. Uh, it changes the way we think about the balance and the reservoirs of water on the planet. Um, and so that's a very exciting and very new study um, that we're making a lot of advances in. So the short answer is, yeah, there's there's quite a bit more water in the mantle than we ever expected. Thank you so much. Now that I will take one more, I think there are two more. One more question I'll take. Uh, Akshara is asking, so you pointed out that rocks have been found in Mars. So can you tell, are they similar to rocks that are found in Earth or uh, are they different from there? Yeah, that's that's another really important question. So we, you know, of course, geologists have spent uh, decades, centuries, uh, trying to learn about how uh, the Earth works by looking at Earth rocks, and so all of our knowledge is based on how things are here. So the question, right? Can we use the lessons we've learned on Earth and apply that to uh, other planets? Um, it turns out, if you're asking about Mars, which was the question. Um, Perhaps surprisingly, yes, the rocks are remarkably similar. Now, there are some differences, but we see similar minerals, familiar minerals, familiar forms. And that's what's really opened our eyes that, wow, at some time in the past, and the question is when, it looks like Mars was remarkably similar to Earth today. Rivers, streams, and lakes. And maybe, maybe life. Um, but this is a great geological puzzle because we know what it looks like today. We're trying to reconstruct what did Mars look like three or four billion years ago. Billion with a B. It looks like that is when Mars was a watery, hospitable place. Um, wonderful question. And there was there one more question on the list there? Yeah, Jan, one more. And I would request Nishad to ask. Please unmute Nishad and ask this last question. And children, uh, you may uh, write it down all your questions. I'll be sharing that Padlet link with Professor Ethan Baxter. Okay, so you will get your answers. So I would request, <laughs> again, Nishad, unmute and please ask your question. Actually, the first thing that came in my mind when, uh, when we started this webinar was like, what inspired you to become a geochemist? Like, what was it? Yeah, in the childhood, of course, you loved collecting rocks, but you know, going through teenage lives and what like sparked something in you, what you know, lit up that made you look into this career path? Thank you so much. That's it's one of my favorite questions, um, and I get it. I get it from a lot of people. And I'm going to answer it in two ways. I'll tell you how it was for me. So I was one of those kids, and maybe Nishad, you're like this. Maybe other folks are there too. Ever since I was a little kid, I just liked rocks. I don't know why <laughs> I did, but um, I, I remember collecting in my neighborhood when I grew up, was here in Massachusetts, uh, there was a lot of mica. You guys know what mica is? It's a beautiful, um, actually, I might have a, oh, I do. This is from, uh, this is in episode 23, um, but they're beautiful. There's a great big shiny uh, mica right there. This is from near, near my house. But when I was a kid, there was lots of mica like this. And I would go up the street. I know just where it was. And I just collected mica. <laughs> I really liked it. And I, I still have my box of mica from when I was five years old. I really do. Um, and so Something about the rocks and minerals just got me interested, but it's where I went with it next, which, which turned it from just a fun childhood curiosity to a career. I started asking questions. What are these things made of? Um, why do I have mica in my neighborhood, but I don't have um, fossils, uh, for example? Um, and it was really those questions that I started asking that really inspired me to go further. And so I think that, you know, for Unishad and for other, other students here, the questions that you're asking 
whether they are things that we've addressed today or they're questions that are in your head, that's the number one most important thing to pay attention to and to listen to. If your questions are about rocks, then ask them and answer them. If they're about plants, if they're about people, if they're about literature or music, when you find yourself asking questions and wanting to learn about something, that's the beginning. As a scientist, that's when you know you're being a scientist. It's when you're asking questions. I'll say one last thing. A lot of times, I think people think about scientists and they think like, oh, that scientist knows a lot. Boy, they, they know a lot. Like They're really impressive because of everything that they know. And what I want to say is this. For a real scientist, science isn't about what you know. Science is about what you don't know. And asking questions, that's science. That's what drives a scientist. It's being passionate about the things that I don't know. That's what gets me up in the morning. Finding a new rock, a new sample, a new question that I have to learn about. And I want to find out. And then I have some of the tools that I've learned to help answer those questions. So that was maybe a longer answer, but I just, I think that's such an important thing. And what I hope, what I hope is that for many of you on, on the screen today, um, maybe you decide you've got questions about rocks and in the earth sciences. Maybe you have questions about science in general, but whatever it is, I hope that you're starting to think about the questions that drive you in science or something else. And you go for it. You go for it. Um, and for me, it was about rocks and it's, it's been, a, it's a one, been a wonderful, fun journey for myself. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you inspired us all with this session and we cannot thank you as much as we are saying right now. So thank uh -huh. you once again. Thank you so much, Nishad. Uh, and I have got some, uh, like, there are many questions, uh, uh, Professor, so I'll be sharing with the report and some pictures with you, and I would request if you could answer those questions, because at the positive time, would not be able to, but yes, I would like to share something wonderful with you, with everybody here. I hope my screen is visible. Just let me know if my screen is visible or not. Okay, just a minute. I'll just, one, two, three. Here I go. This is one word from my students for you, Professor. Thank you. Wonderful. I, I love request it. Request now, uh, Ms. Shanaz, to propose word of thanks. Thank you, Ethan, for such a wonderful evening. It was not only informative for the children who had logged in, but uh, for the teachers as well, because we came to know many new things. Uh, most of the teachers who have logged in today are social science teachers teaching geography. So we have got something new to take to our children. I want to thank you. And we never felt that you are sitting so far away from us. You're such a wonderful educator. You are a real teacher. We really admire you and we are, you have inspired us all. Thank you so much. On behalf of our DPS schools, Varanasi, Nagpur, Nasik, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to you for this wonderful session. We'll always remember this session and we have a lot of takeaways also. Thank you. For now on, we'll say goodbye, but we are going to meet soon. And goodbye. I would request everybody to switch cameras on so that I can click one photo together, everyone. Oh, yes. Together. <laughs> One, two, three, together. V. <laughs>